This KLRN program is proudly supported by HEB. About what people know about the Baptist settlement, which is probably not a whole lot. Uh, you know, African American presence across San Antonio has been found uh, as far south as uh, Texas A&M, as far north as Wetmore, west around Acme Road. A lot of people don't recognize that there was the Baptist settlement in what today is Hemisphere Park. Explain to me and the audience how that history got lost. Well, quite simply, you have to go all the way back to the Canary Islander settlement from 1731, when the Canary Islanders, coming from off the west coast of Africa, uh, came to San Antonio to colonize the area. Um, and they came in two separate groups. One group were black Canary Islanders, or Christianized Moors from the Canary Islanders, because the Canary Islands were conquered by the Spaniards in three separate wars against the native inhabitants, who were Berbers and Moors and Africans. So, but they lose these battles, they're Christianized then, then they come with the Canary Islanders, and the problem um, was that the Spaniards had a racial caste system, and that caste system required that if you were darker-skinned uh, African, darker-skinned Christianized Moor, Canary Islander Moor, uh, even mixed-race people and darker-skinned Native Americans, you had to live on the eastern side of the San Antonio River which became the first line of segregation in San Antonio. So the, the lighter skinned Spaniards, or the ones who considered themselves white, whatever that meant, lived on the western side of the river. Um, so this is how the east side becomes the historical black community. Um, and eventually, after that, 100 years or more, actually more, later after the Civil War, uh, it becomes the Baptist settlement, meaning newly sleeve freed slaves come into this area occupy the area and it becomes an enclave uh, uh, of black people um, who knew newly freed slaves. But of course, remembering that the black presence on the eastern side of the river was already established because the Canary Islanders did that under that racial system that they had. So it became the Baptist settlement and people get confused. What's the difference between Baptist settlement and Santo Street? Well, Santo Street is just a street inside the Baptist settlement. There are several of them. And La Vaca Street, uh, and now Cesar Chavez. And so uh, that area, which was really large at one time, was the home to Mount Zion First Baptist Church at, at one point, uh, before they had a pilgrimage all the way to the present location in, 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 during that period of time, it's 1870s, 80s, and so forth. Uh, but there are also other black churches that were in the Baptist settlement. So, and unfortunately, uh, at one point, they decided to move poorer whites into the area, and it was a housing project in around 18, 1930s or so. Um, the Victoria Courts. Yeah, the Victoria Courts is established, and it's an all-white housing project. So here you have an all-white housing project that's now going to start di displacing the African-American population, so the African-American population starts moving further east. Um, and it's already scattered throughout the city as well, as you mentioned, in different parts of town, but the great bulk was in east of the river. And 37, the construction there, I believe, also led Second Baptist to have to move to its current location on Commerce Street. And that's correct, and, and it also, uh, it, it was also had other names at the time as well. <clears throat> but it was in the area that we know as St. Paul Square, mm -hmm. the Sunset Station, mm -hmm. same, same area, but that was a heavily, heavily black occupied area, <clears throat> not only of church, but of businesses as well that existed for a very long period of time. And recently, uh, the folks working on San Pedro Creek found the foundation of the St. James AME Church. Mm -hmm. A lot of folks don't think of the African-American presence just west of downtown, but of course, uh, there were African-American uh, church enclaves, as you mentioned, Reverend Dykes and, and others, uh, as far as Acme Road and, and other places. Um, so you had a, kind of a west side group of African-American churches too, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and the housing projects in Lincoln Courts, just to the, to the west of uh, Zazamora Street, uh, right off of Culebra. And, and of course, closer to that, to San Pedro Park, was Newcombville, which was an area established by James Newcomb, by the way, who, who founded the San Antonio Express newspaper. Uh, Mr. Newcomb was a union sympathizer. He ran out of town, right? ran him out of town, 
Uh, he comes back after the Civil War in vengeance almost because he becomes the registrar of voters. So he's empowered to register black people and at the same time he becomes a, a, a renter. He becomes a landlord. So he's one of the few people that will rent to African Americans in, on those streets uh, close to San Pedro Park, French Street, et cetera, et cetera. Like my grandmother. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, in those streets, uh, he, he rented to black people and the people bought homes over there. So Newcomb established this place called Newcombville at the time, right near San Pedro Park, which has a long history in and of itself. Um, but these are important things that people don't know or haven't even, not a lot of research has gone into it. Uh, of course, uh, we were talking about Reverend Black earlier in the segment, and we lead into the more modern evolution of the black church in the civil rights movement. Uh, of course, there was also the role of the black church in the human rights movement to help South Africa with apartheid. Tell me a little bit about uh, what Reverend Black and, and the SNCC organization did. Well, uh, after SNCC is, is no longer in existence, a group called Organizations United for Eastside Development, and later on another group, called Frontline 2000, which actually is the group that got the Martin Luther King state holiday. Right out of San Antonio. You mentioned that, yeah. yeah. Um, led, led in part by um, uh, Pastor Reverend John Sanders. That's right. Um, and John Sanders was an officer in the group. So that, that's very important. But uh, during the time that Nelson Mandela was in prison, there was a local movement called the Free Nelson Mandela Movement, the anti-apartheid movement, and we began to draft a resolution that we could present to city council because at city council they, in San Antonio, the, the gold coin shops, the jewelry shops, the big ones, they were selling a gold coin called the Krugerrand coin, which was being used in South Africa to actually undo the anti-apartheid movement. It was money coming in from this gold coin that was being printed and then spread throughout the world. And so shops in San Antonio were selling it. So we asked Reverend Black if he would help us author, or author himself a resolution that would go before city council urging the citizens of San Antonio not to buy this gold coin, which was the face of racism in South Africa. He did that. The resolution was passed. I think it was only one council member voted against it by the name of Henry Van Archer. He voted against it but everybody else supported Reverend Black on the council to urge people not to buy that apartheid coin. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the now Reverend Joe Webb. He wasn't a minister at the time he was on council, but uh, he did sing at a lot of folks' funerals, and uh, that was something that helped him, I'm, I'm sure, politically a lot. Uh, but of course, Reverend Joe Webb would be the longest serving black city council person. Um, and, uh, and, and so his impact is quite large in, in terms of mobilizing. Well, yeah, and, 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 and he from the very beginning supported what we were doing. So he kind of took over that, the reins of support for the civil rights movement. <clears throat> he supported us with a great deal of pressure placed on him as well. Um, because he appointed members of former members of SNCC and members of OUED to city boards and commissions, and they didn't like that. And so he did a good job of carrying on that tradition of, of the black church in terms of militancy, in terms of fighting for civil rights. So Reverend Webb did a good job too after um, Reverend Black left, left the political scene. So just in wrapping up uh, the history, um, when we look at the impact of the Martin Luther King March, which, um, you know, to understand how that grew here, it was moved around, uh, around town, and churches around town were part of that process. Um, but just in terms of how ministers participated in the state holiday, I remember as a little boy uh, seeing you and, 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 and John Sanders and even Reverend Callie's on the steps of the Texas Capitol. Um, how, how did the San Antonio ministers help with the Martin Luther King state holiday in the 80s? Well, a, lo a lot of uh, ministers were there. They would go um, and on, with buses and go to Austin every single year to ask the state legislature, both in the Senate and the House, to pass a Martin Luther King bill. And the Senate always did that, but it never could be passed in the House. So it was a continuing effort, and people did this for years of going before the Texas legislature trying to get a bill passed. Of course, we had the national bill there, but the state was not honoring King, one of three states still left during that period of time, 1980 or so. And so um, 
many pastors said, and not just pastors, but former members of SNCC and OUED and Frontline 2000 in this case, um, said, you know, doing this over and over again is just not being very productive because they're taking a Martin Luther King bill and the Speaker of the House would actually order the chair of the calendars committee to take that bill and put it on the bottom of the stack so it would never come up for a vote. So Rick Green, who was a member of OUED, was a SNCC member before that, uh, you see the continuity there. He said, you know what, uh, Mario, I'm gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna get this bill passed. And I go, okay, is it legal? <laughs> and his question to me was, no, nothing illegal, it's legal. And I said, well, what are we gonna do? And his response to me, we're gonna take their football away. So I was like, take your, are we gonna grab the ball at the Dallas football game and <laughs> run off the field with it or what? He goes, no, no, no. Uh, and, and we had a meeting at Rick's house and he said, here's how, what we're going to do. We're going to threaten a boycott against the state. At the time, he, the timing was perfect. It was perfect timing. Um, they were having, Houston wanted the Super Bowl. Um, and, and, and in those days, the NFL allowed cities to bid on who was going to get the Super Bowl. It's a different method now. But they bid. Houston had in a bid to get the Super Bowl in Houston. Well, guess what? Rick said, no Super Bowl if we don't get a Martin Luther King state holiday. And this resonated across the state. It resonated with she uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, the, now the congressman. Uh, it resonated with Ron Wilson, the state rep out of Houston. It resonated with San Antonio pastors uh, and others that said, this is perfect. Taking their football away, so to speak, is a way to get the King uh, bill passed. And guess what? The, the Speaker of the House, uh, uh, gosh, Gib Lewis, told Pete Laney, the chair of the calendars committee, uh, you need to move that bill forward. I, we got a call the very next day from um, the, the, the governor's office, Ann Richards at the time. She, her office called me and her secretary said, how did y'all do this? They didn't know how we did it. And, and because the, the speaker of the house met with us for about 15 minutes, it was a short meeting. And he simply said, the bill will be pulled out of committee, up for a vote the following day. And it was. So, and I told uh, the governor's secretary, she, when she asked, how did y'all do it? I said, well, we just threatened to take their football away. It, just imagine if we had threatened to take their beer away. <laughs> it would have been, uh, we could have got anything we wanted. But it did, yeah. and we signed, the, uh, the governor signed that bill. Uh, Renee Watson was there. We have a lot of people with OUED, former members of SNCC were there um, when the governor signed that bill into law at her mansion in Austin. Oh, that's amazing. I think it's important to remember that uh, the, the black church is the people of the church as well. And so in as much as you had members like yourself of Mount Zion and many other churches, people of faith in the community were doing many things in the civil rights movement to help make it happen. So thank you, Mario, so much for your contributions to civil rights and the community. Thank you.